Good evening. It is uh, 7 01 Eastern Time PM. I would like to welcome you all to the Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. My name is Tatiana Gorbacheva. I'm from Einstein Medical Center, Philadelphia, now part of Jefferson, and I will be serving as a moderator for this session. First of all, I would like to remind everybody to please sign into poll everywhere. This is going to be an interactive session today. And the topic for today's webinar is imaging of the shoulder and introduction. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, you our speaker for this webinar. It is Dr. Navid Faraji. Navid is an assistant professor of musculoskeletal radiology at the University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center, Case Western Reserve University. This is the place he did his radiology residency and the MSK fellowship. Uh, Dr. Faraji is an as associate program director at radiology residency program. He also an assistant professor in anatomy at uh, Case Western and we want to congratulate him on him winning a medical student teacher of the year last year. Navid is a big sports fan and he loves sports imaging. We'll, we'll witness that firsthand very soon. And the, the coolest thing about his work is the opportunity to do imaging for the Cleveland Browns football team. So again, everyone, please sign to poll everywhere and let's give it up for Dr. Faraji. Now we take it away, please. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Gorbachova, for the lovely introduction. Uh, thank you to the SSR for inviting me and allowing me to have this opportunity. And thank you to the Veritas folks for helping to get this session run smoothly. Um, the audience, you guys missed a very hectic last few 10, 15 minutes. We were having some technical difficulties, multi, mostly because of my, uh, because of me, but we worked it all out thanks to the, the help of the group. So i um, looking forward to doing this and let's we're going to go on a ride together so I figure though before we go on this ride we should get it take a moment to get to know each other so I'm going to start with just a few slides um, talking about so I'm a big ultimate frisbee fan and you can see from some of these gifs or gifs I don't know it depends on uh, who you ask that you know, in ultimate frisbee, there's a lot of diving, and you can, on an abducted shoulder, um, be prone to dislocations and blunt trauma to the rotator cuff can also cause some acute rotator cuff tears. I would know firsthand because this happened to me um, just four weeks ago a partial uh, infraspinatus tendon tear, and, and I tore my labrum. But, you know, what the things we do for the activities we love so if you haven't played i recommend trying it's a fun game very chill and you'll meet a lot of new people make a lot of good connections so check it out uh, additionally so i've got a dog here he is his name is Rumi. uh yes yes i did when with my wife get professional photos of us and our animals but yes that's uh my dog Rumi. he's uh lab pitbull mix this is our cat bb and this is our other cat, Grady. Um, so we have a lot of animals in this house. We are outnumbered. But transitioning a little bit. So here's uh, the R1s um, who are at our residency program. There's 10 of us, uh, 10 in each class. And you can see from uh, this photograph that they're all very happy to be there. So um, hopefully we can, uh, I was using this opportunity as just a little plug for our program. And uh, if, if there's any medical students out there, or also we all have a musculoskeletal imaging fellowship. We can see in the top right, lovely picture of Cleveland. And we have a myriad of parks, um, nice fall foliage, and we have a national park in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So now that we've become acquainted, um, figure if we can move on to the to the reason you all are here. Uh, Dr. Gorbachev is going to give it a No, I'm just kidding. Um, but he, Yes, yeah, so you're stuck with me for the next 45 minutes. So here we go. Let's start with anatomy. So one of my uh, MSK attendings, Dr. the late Dr. Robin, always emphasized uh, how important it is to know your anatomy. Because if you don't know your anatomy, then it's going to be difficult to kind of figure out what's going on when you are start looking at pathology. So we have to know normal anatomy. And we're going to start there and build upon that. So uh, just another slide, kind of confirm for everybody to make sure you're on the poll everywhere. 
I'll give it another 10, 15 seconds or so because we're going to be polling here pretty soon. And I know in a talk such as this, uh, for such a prestigious organization, I'm not supposed to ask any polarizing questions or controversial questions, but I couldn't help myself. So we're going to start with a, you know, a controversial question here. Um, so are you a tuberosity person or a tubercle person? Um, no judgment here, but... I just want everybody to a lot of tuberosity folks out there so far. We got we got a tubercle in there, but it's, you know, it's a lot of tuberosities. I'm a tuberosity person myself. I actually Googled it because I was I was wanted to know for this talk, is there a right way or a wrong way? You can keep voting as I'm talking if you'd like. But apparently, yeah, I found somewhere on the web you'll have to, you know, check to confirm, but tubercle is the name. Uh, appropriate name for smaller insertions, tuberosities for like medium size or moderate insertions, um, allegedly. So that's what Dr. Google told me, but I'm a tuberosity person myself, and I'm glad we're all on the same page, at least the majority of us, uh, those 12%, I got, I'm not sure what to tell you. All right, so here's uh, some basic anatomy, right? Thankfully, you know, so in medicine, there's a lot of body parts named after people, a lot of pathology named after people, ligaments um, named after people. And sometimes they can get confusing, but thankfully the rotator cuff is an exception to that. And things are named in a relatively intuitive fashion. All right. So we have here, we can see our scapula and hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. We see our scapula. We're looking at the dorsal or posterior aspect of the scapula. We see the scapular spine, which leads to the acromion process. And we have the clavicle coming across. The muscle and tendon that's above the spine is called the supraspinatus. Thankfully, a reasonable person named that. Um, below the spine, we have the infraspinatus. That's also quite reasonable. And then on the anterior surface, or the um, you know the anterior surface or the undersurface of the scapula, when we look on this anterior view, we have the subscapularis, and we can see the subscapularis also appropriately named as being on the undersurface or anterior surface of the scapula. It has a multi pennate muscle and tendon architecture, and we can see that's different than the rest of the, the cuff and supra infra. And then the other one is the other one. So I have this thing where like, if there's four things to memorize, you know, if you know three of them, then the other one is the other one. So the teres minor is the other one. Um, it's not as intuitively named, at least I don't really know Latin that well, but this one is uh, inferior um, to the infraspinatus. So in summary, supra above the spine, infra below the spine, teres minor below infra, and this, these are all posterior dorsal structures. And then we have the subscapularis, which is the ventral uh, multipennate uh, muscle slash tendon that inserts onto the lesser tuberosity. It's the only one. And the lesser tuberosity is the more anterior of the two tuberosities, or in the, whereas the greater tuberosity is more uh, superior and posterior. So here's a lateral view of the humerus, and we can see this is anterior to the right of the screen and posterior to the left of the screen. And here's our lesser tuberosity where we can see the um, subscapularis inserts, and then we have the greater tuberosity. And there's three facets of the greater tuberosity, so this is like some next level stuff here. It's not just two things anymore. Now we have three facets of the greater tuberosity, the superior, middle, and inferior facets. And as you can imagine, the supraspinatus infraspinatus and teres minor um, insert on those respectively. There is some overlap between the supra and infra insertions as we'll see later. Um, here is an ant or a posterior view. Again, we can see the more vertically oriented inferior facet, the more obliquely oriented middle facet, and the more horizontally oriented superior facet. And then uh, this was nicely um, demonstrated in a review article by Jacobson et al. Uh, about shoulder ultrasound, where we can see the superior, middle, and inferior facets, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus inserting, and there's a little bit of overlap in, in between them, where some might refer to as the common tendon. And then between the lesser and greater tuberosities or tubercles, we have the intertubercular sulcus, where we see our long head of the biceps tendon. And here's a little anatomic dissection here that, again, we can see from the posterior aspects, supra, infra, teres minor, and subscap would be on the anterior or ventral surface. So we should also know, similar to the Achilles tendon, there is a relatively avascular critical zone of the rotator cuff tendons. Um, and we can see on this histopathologic um, sample here that we see the supraspinatus muscle 
uh, infraspinatus muscle vasculature. We see the humeral head and there's some vasculature coming from there, but there's a relatively avascular zone between those areas, about one to two centimeters from the insertion. And you know, this study was actually showed that there's not a lot of difference in the vascularity of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons, but it's known that there is more the supraspinatus more commonly becomes pathologic as far as tears and tendinosis. So there's got to be more to the injury pattern than just a relatively avascular zone, or else you would surmise that supraspinatus and infraspinatus may be injured or pathologic at similar uh, frequencies, but that's not the case. And therefore, there are some extrinsic uh, factors that are likely um, contributing to the pathology there. So I know we're here to talk about MR, but I always got to do a little bit of radiography because I think it helps you to, you know, we infrequently ever, we never want to read an MRI without a concomitant radiograph. Um, so it's nice to just look at the anatomy here. And again, we're looking at this AP radiograph and we can see this broad undersurface of the scapula where the subscapularis you can imagine would be with a tendon, multi penate tendon coming, inserting onto the lesser tuberosity. Here in the scapular Y view, we can see the suprascapular fossa or the supraspinatus would be infraspinatus and teres minor below that. And a really important factor too to consider when you're looking at these is where is the coracoid process? So we see coracoid is anterior. It's the most anterior structure of the scapula. And whereas the ochromian is relatively posterior. So that's useful when you're looking at an MRI because if you're looking at a single coronal image and you can't scroll back and forth. If you see coracoid, you know you're relatively anterior and you're probably dealing with subscap potentially or supra. If you see a chromium, you're probably more posterior, right? So it's, these landmarks are useful to kind of orient you when given a single image um, rather than the ability to scroll. And so when we do uh, MRI of the rotator cuff, you know, Again, so you folks are hopefully familiar with an AP shoulder radiograph versus a Grashy shoulder radiograph. And so if you're familiar with that concept and you know that the shoulder girdle is not in the same plane as the rest of the chest, it's angled anteriorly about 30 degrees, let's say. So if you want a true, if you, if you want the supraspinatus to be laid out in its entirety long axis, then we can't just do a tr anterior true coronal. We have to oblique our coronal in order to get the supraspinatus and the rest of the cuff laid out in long axis. Um, similarly, if we want to see a true short axis, we need to do an oblique sagittal, not just the plain sagittal, the shoulder, which will not truly lay it out in its short axis. So we need to oblique our coronal um, and, and sagittal views to get a true um, really cross section of the tendons. And then we have axials that are perpendicular. So I have some, a lot of videos here. So I'm gonna take us through the anatomy here as I would in the reading room. And so here we can see we're far anterior. This is our coracoid process right here. And we're gonna have our short head, the bi biceps and conjoint tendon um, from the originating from the coracoid process. And just beneath the coracoid process, we start to see this relatively broad muscle and that's our subscapularis. And now as we proceed posteriorly, we begin to see the multi penate tendon architecture of the subscap um, inserting as it comes across the insert on the lesser tuberosity. And when I'm looking at the subscap on the on the coronal plane, I want to make sure that it's nice and taut. Okay, if it's if I see any of these fibers peeling up in this cranial caudal di direction, then that's suspicious for a tear um, to me, and I would confirm that on the axial views. But that's when I start getting my hackles up. Um, but we have to keep in mind, you know, patients demonstrate varying degrees of external rotation when when they're having their MR MRIs taken. And if the patient is internally rotated, that's going to limit our evaluation of the subscapularis tendon. So it's really important that we work with the patient as much as possible, but to get them as externally rotated as possible. And you can imagine if they're internally rotated, then our long head of the biceps tendon might be more in an anterior position. But since this is a relatively young, compliant patient um, who's able to tolerate it, we were able to externally rotate them. And we can see the long head biceps tendon now coming in the intertubercular stalcus here laterally and originating here from the superior labrum and supraglenoid tubercle. And as we course posterior to the long head biceps tendon, we should see the leading edge of the supraspinatus tendon insertion. So here's still long head biceps 
And then we begin to see the leading edge of the supraspinatus tendon insertion. This patient is quite externally rotated, so it's a little bit more lateral and uh, posterior than one might expect. But just keep in mind, you have to, when you're interpreting these, you have to consider the patient positioning. So we see this nice homogeneously low signal intensity, hypo intense tendon without any intervening fluid signal intensity, without increased intrasubstance signal on this fluid sensitive sequence. We see a little bit of fluid in the long advisive tendon sheet there. So that tells us it's fluid sensitive. We see the bone marrow is dark or hypo intense. And we see the sub Q fat is hypo intense, telling us it's a fat saturated fluid sensitive sequence, T2, or maybe a fluid sensitive PD, depending on the place. We can see a nice triangular superior labrum without any intervening fluid signal intensity. And we can see some nice intermediate bright signal intensity articular cartilage without any full thickness defects. Now here we can see our AC joint and supraspinatus coursing inferior to it. So, you know, there's a relatively intimate relationship between the acromial clavicular joint, the acromion, and the underlying supraspinatus. And we'll get to that later. Um, it can cause pathology depending on the morphology of the acromion and the AC joint. And as we go a little bit more posterior, then as you can expect, we're going to see a more obliquely oriented infraspinatus tendon and continue posteriorly, and we're going to see a more obliquely and posterior teres minor tendon. And honestly, so we need to keep in mind the uh, the patterns of disease. So as far as common um, you know entities, and it's my experience in literature shows that the supra tends to tear more than infra, tends to tear way more than teres minor. I've haven't seen that many teres minor tears in my experience. Um, and then so anterior to posterior for the greater tuberosity insertions and articular surface to bursal surface in general. Um, whereas the subscapularis tendon anteriorly tends to, to tear from cranial to caudal. Um, here's a sagittal plane which will be a little bit quicker. So we can notice our sagittal plane is fat sensitive. Okay, we can see that the fat is bright. Um, we're not fat saturating because we wanna be able to quantify as we'll discuss later, the degree of uh, fatty atrophy of the musculature because fatty atrophy has a prognostic um, implication. So we wanna make sure um, that we have a ability to quantify fatty atrophy qualitatively at least um, by both the volume of the muscle within the fossa and the amount of fatty infiltration. So, and we'll touch more on that later. And another thing I want to point out, there's some nerves here we can talk about. Here's our suprascapular nerve coursing inferiorly through the spinal glenoid notch, and there can be impingement syndromes. We can see our axillary neurovascular bundle here in the quadrant the lateral space. And then again, I want to just impress upon you folks and the audience, the AC joint and this underlying fat plane. It's really, you know, that's something I look for in maintenance of that fat plane uh, underlying the acromioclavicular joint. When I'm suggesting the possibility of external impingement, I want to see that fat plane lost. And last thing I want to mention is sagittal is really great plane for looking at the long head biceps tendon. We can see here's our supraglenoid tubercle and in short axis, we can see the long intraarticular portion. It's kind of this grayish thing. You can see it better on fluid sensitive sequences. It's right here now. And then I'm going to follow it out. It's coming out here, here, here. And you're going to see it come all the way down and out through the intertubercular groove. And then last but not least, before we get to the fun pathology stuff, Here's an axial fluid sensitive fat saturated sequence. Here's our acromial clavicular joint. Great plane to look for any osochromial. Um, this patient is almost fully fused, but some patients never do, and that they have an osochromial. Here's our supraspinatus tendon here, um, coursing over. And mostly here, I'm looking at the labrum. We can see the anterior labrum, the posterior labrum. Um, we can see the extra articular long head biceps. We can see the subscapularis tendon as well, coursing um, anteriorly and on this nicely external rotated patient. So the labrum, you know, the anterior and posterior labrum is really well visualized on the axial, whereas the superior and inferior labrum is relatively well seen on the coronal. And then you use them in combination to kind of characterize labral tears and rotator cuff tears. Okay, so here's one case. I want everybody to take a close look at this because there's gonna be a question coming up in the next slide. So take a look, see Lou, and then we're gonna get on to the next slide. I want you to concentrate on this area and this area, and then on this whole situation here, okay? All right, I can go back, but just take a close look, see what you think. <laughs> 
Okay, so the findings on the axial and coronal MRI reflect split tear of the long head biceps, aponeurotic expansion of the supraspinatus tendon, anterior superlabral tear, normal labrum and MGHL, or both B and D. Okay, so we got a lot of A's and that's the whole point of this slide. A few B's, a few C's and a few E's. I'm gonna move on because I just checked the clock and I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit here, but take a look at this. So this is same patient, same MRI, all right? And I want you to see some normal anatomy here, right? So first things first, here's our anterior labrum. This is our middle glenohumeral ligament. This is the common, um, you know, common variant, it's not a variant, but it can mimic disease, right? So MGHL can be well opposed and there can be a little bit of fluid signal between that. And you don't want to mistake that for a labral tear. Similarly, here's our long head of the biceps tendon. And this is our aponeurotic expansion of the supraspinatus tendon. And that can mimic a split tear of the long head biceps. And I want to prove it to you by showing you. So follow this. This is our long head biceps tendon. I will look at the superior labrum right here. And follow the superior labrum, you're going to see the long head biceps tendon coming out here. I'm just going to do this again. Okay, so we see the long head biceps tendon, which is the more medial linear structure, and it's going to go and originate from the superior labrum. Conversely, if we follow the more lateral of these hypointense lines, we can follow that right here. And as we go more posterior, we're going to be able to follow that in continuity with the supraspinatus tendon. So just know that there's a structure known as the aponeurotic expansion of the supraspinatus tendon that can be relatively thick and cord-like, and it can mimic a long head biceps tendon tear. So you really want to follow it on your axials and your coronals to confirm that it's a true split tear and not just an aponeurotic expansion. Now watch that anterior one. You're going to see it come up, up. It's right here. And we're going to go back and it's gonna join with, it's right here now, and it's gonna join with our supraspinatus tendon on this more cranial slice. Okay, moving on. So let's do some bread and butter cases, folks. Easy peasy here, right? So we've got a shoulder. It's a fluid sensitive, fat saturated sequence. And we see a pretty ugly looking cuff tendon here. This is our supraspinatus tendon. And we can see that it's increased signal intensity and it is relatively thicky thicky, as I like to say, it's thick, increased signal intensity tendon, and it that's abnormal. If you compare that to the case we saw previously, the normal young anatomy patient, um, this is thick and increased signal. This is tendinosis, and we can rate it mild, moderate, or severe. It's kind of a gestalt thing, depending on how thick it is and how much signal it has. But the key is we don't see any fluid signal intensity within this tendon to suggest a tear. So no fluid signal intensity in general. It's an oversimplification, but no tear, okay? so. Which of the following, if we see a tear, should be documented in an MRI report of a rotator cuff tear? A, the AP dimension. And you, got, you folks know, hopefully by now, that if there's all these answer choices and the last one is all of the above, then it's probably all of the above. So let's, but let's talk, touch on this topic. So if I see a cuff tear, it's really important for me to describe the AP dimension of that tear. Okay, so that means on a sagittal plane, um, I'll measure the tears anterior to posterior width. So how much of the AP dimension of that tendon insertion is involved, okay? The degree of tendon retraction. So if it's a full thickness tear or high grade tear where there's some retraction of the tendon, how far is it retracted? Because that is an indirect uh, sign of how compliant that tendon is for the surgeon and will they be able to get it to insert again onto the greater or lesser tuberosity. How much muscle atrophy? Again, that's another secondary indicator of how compliant that tendon will be when they go in surgically. Um, how much of the thickness of the tendon is involved? So is it a full thickness tear or is it only some of the bursal side that's torn? Is it only some of the articular side that's torn or is it an intrasubstance tearing? So is it, you know, how much of that tendon is torn in like the cranial caudal dimension, the insertional dimension? And then which surface of the tendon is torn, as I just alluded to, is it articular, bursal, or intrasubstance tearing? So we'll see it. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in some cases. But so we can see the footprint here of this tendon inserting supraspinatus. And we can see, so this is the articular surface, 
deep. This is the bursal surface. Superficial to the bursal surface is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, hence the name of the bursal surface, okay? And so this red line indicates the insertion of the footprint, and it's about 10 to 12 millimeters in most people. And less than three millimeters of tearing is grade one, three to six is grade two, and greater than six is grade three. And so the surgeon wants to know, these are some various indications for surgery is, bursal sided tears greater than three millimeters could, could be an indication for repair, partial articular sided tears greater than 50%, and acute full thickness tears. Okay, and there's other indications, but this is, these are some of them. So we want to describe how much of the tendon's thickness is torn to kind of further guide the management and whether it's bursal or articular, whether it's acute or chronic, and the muscle atrophy will be a good indicator of that. So here's a quick case. So we can see, you know, just take my word for it, that this is the anterior supraspinatus tendon. We can confirm that on this sagittal plane here, where we see this is the more anterior aspect of the greater tuberosity, where anterior is to the left, posterior is to the right. And we can see that there's some fluid signal intensity involving the articular surface of the supraspinatus tendon insertion. And we can see that here as well. And, you know, I don't usually measure it. You could go low grade as, um, you know, less than 50%, moderate grade is about 50%, and greater than 50% could suggest high grade partial thickness tearing. So, you know, everybody's a little bit different. Maybe this is a low grade articular surface tear, the far anterior insertional supraspinatus tendon superimposed upon mild tendinosis, for example. So we're looking for fluid signal intensity. We're looking whether it's the insertion or the pre-insertional tendon or the myotendinous junction and the under underlying signal intensity of the tendon to, so they know if they're going in surgically, am I dealing with mashed potatoes that I'm not going to be able to tack back down? Or is this tendon actually have some substance that I could work with? Okay, here's another one. Click on the abnormality in this case. Not sure exactly how this works, if I was supposed to put bounding boxes or not, but we'll see. I'm going to give... Yeah, I'd well, love to see that. Oh, wow. I mean, you guys don't need me. You are already brilliant people out here. All right, so a lot of things there, I agree, right? So there is an intrasubstance fluid signal intensity within the musculature here. And I wanted to point out to you this relative, uh, this pearl, I guess, is that that's generally a sign that there is a tear of the tendon, whether it's intrasubstance tearing or articular surface tearing that's extending down the substance of the infraspinatus uh, musculature, it's an indication that there is a tear there. And I'll prove it to you here on this case where we see, excuse me, let me just pause. Okay, so we can see here's our relatively horizontal supraspinatus tendon insertion. And as we go posteriorly, we start to see just a little hint of fluid signal intensity and the infraspinatus tendon. And we can see the articular surface is intact, the bursal surface is intact, and we start to see that fluid signal intensity creeping up into the substance of the tendon and forming that you know, intrasubstance ganglion that we saw previously. So this uh, is an indicator that there is a tendon tear at the footprint. Okay, here's another one for you. Click on the retracted tendon stump. Yes, yes. Love to see that. All right, so we have a full thickness tear here, right? We see a bunch of fluid here. I'm gonna go to the next slide now. We see a bunch of fluid here in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, which is in continuity with the joint when you have a full thickness tendon tear. And we see that the full thickness tear, the tendon stump is retracted to the level of the glenohumeral joint. Um, just some second, and we can see here, I see no tendon inserting onto, you know, I see infra is intact to some degree, but we likely have a full thickness tear involving the entirety of the supra and extending into the anterior infra. Um, and then we can see this is relatively chronic. One, it's because I can see some undersurfing, under undersurface scalloping of the acromion, aka acetabularization of the acromion, which indicates a full thickness cuff tear because you get a high riding humeral head when you have a chronic full thickness tear. And we can see a ganglion cyst. This is our geyser sign in the subcutaneous soft tissues of the you know, superficial to the deltoid in the AC joint because, you know, full thickness cuff tear allows fluid to kind of sometimes seep, seep into the AC joint and then through there and form this ganglion cyst, which is the geyser sign and can commonly present as a palpable mass.
And then, so here's some muscle atrophy. We can see that this muscle, the, the supraspinatus tendon, does not fill the suprascapular fossa um, at all, really, about 50% or less. And then we can see this is Wagyu. You do not want your cuff to look like Wagyu. I know Wagyu, everybody loves it nowadays, but you know we want our cuffs to look like a nice, lean, like grass-fed, never grain fed steak. No Wagyu for us, all right? We want a nice, healthy cuff. All right, so there's various ways in the literature that this has been classified. The Goutalier classification is one of those ways, and this is mostly how much fat is within the muscle. It's like fat quantity relative to muscle quantity. Or if you're, you know, if you like the simple way, you can do the tangent line sign. And if the muscle does not fill the, the suprascapular fossa above this tangent line, that's an indicator of muscle atrophy. So moving on, you know, nice quote from this RSNA article um, where basically that there is a correlation between muscle atrophy and, and tear recurrence after surgical repair. So if the suprascapular, supraspinous muscle does not, um, does not occupy greater than 50% of that fossa, that is a poor prognostic indicator if that tendon were to be repaired. And lastly, for the cuff, I wanna talk about external impingement. So we see radiographs all the time. And you know, anybody can read an MRI with enough experience, but I think it takes a person who has looked at enough MRIs to be really good at MSK radiographs, similar to chest radiography and CT. And I think one of my favorite things to do is see something on an X-ray that some other people may not have been able to based on their experience. And that's what I love about MSK. And we can see here nicely that there's some acromial clavicular degenerate inferiorly projecting uh, distal clavicular osteophyte. And we can see nicely here that there's some bowing of this uh, supraspinatus tendon inferiorly due to mass effect from that osteophyte. And then we can see here on the sagittal plane that there is loss of that subacromial fat plane as we had discussed previously. And that's another thing I look for when I'm, you know, suggesting a possibility of external impingement. It's important to keep in mind that's a syndrome. It's not something we can diagnose, but we can say that these morphologic findings can be associated with that and they can correlate their physical examination. Okay, so all the followings are variants of the glenoid labrum. We're doing good. We're doing good. So let's see which one of these is not a variant. Yeah. Sorry if I'm bursting some of your bubbles who have not been able to vote yet, but agreed. Um, the bank card is not a variant, and we're going to talk about what a bank card is. For those of you who don't know, for those of you who do know, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But these are all variants. So again, we need to know the variants in normal anatomy before we can talk about pathology. So Buford, Sulcus, foramen are variants of the glenoid labrum, whereas a bank card is a pathology of the osseous glenoid or the so soft tissue labrum. So here's another question. When viewed in FOSS, the glenoid most resembles which fruit? One of these is my favorite fruit, but it's not the answer to this question, unfortunately. Monkey fruit is a good guess. I, I had to like Google it to make sure it was actually a fruit before I put it in there. But yes, a pear. Pear-shaped glenoid, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. For those of you who are anxiously awaiting for me to tell you my favorite fruit, it is the pomegranate, preferably already decurnaled, but not prepackaged decurnaled. Like if my mom did it for me, that would be ideal situation, fresh pomegranate. It's a real pain in the butt to prepare, but when it's freshly prepared in a bowl and all you got to do is eat it with a spoon, that's like the best thing that anybody could ever give me in case anybody was looking to give me anything. All right, so here's our pear-shaped glenoid. We have some glenohumeral ligaments. So we know the labrum is an important thing, but you know the glenohumeral ligaments are really important for the passive stability of the glenohumeral joint, specifically the inferior glenohumeral ligament um, inserts partially on the antero-inferior glenoid. So a glenoid labrum. And if you have a labral tear in this region, you know, you can imagine that there's going to be a little bit extra motion with this IGHL, and that is you know important cause of instability, you know, especially with passive range of motion, whereas the rotator cuff is more important for dynamic stability. So we really, um, you know, the middle superior glenohumeral ligament is here, middle and inferior glenohumeral ligament, but I'll show you a little bit better on this arthrogram where we can see, ooh, that's very fast. Okay. We can see here nicely, boom. Okay, you don't see the superior one quite well here, but here's our middle glenohumeral ligament, and here's our inferior glenohumeral ligament. We can see how intimately associated the IGHL is with that anterior inferior aspect of that labrum. So here we go. 
Um, all right, take a look, see Lou, at this thing. We can see on this more cranial image that we see the posterior labrum. We do not see this anterior superior labrum, but we see this MGHL middle glenohumeral ligament that's relatively thickened and cord-like. But when we get to the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid, then we see a normal labrum. So this is one of those variants that we discussed, and this is known as the Buford complex. I'm um, not sure if you're familiar. I've never actually had one, but there's the Big Buford, which is a burger that is served at Checkers, in case it helps you to remember. This sometimes ridiculous things help me to remember things. Okay, so here is another variant that I would like you to take a look at. And this is our sublabral foramen. All right, so we can see here anterior superiorly, there's fluid signal intensity smoothly marginated, undermining this anterior superior labrum. This is our MGHL, and I would love to zoom in on this, but there's a little bit of increased signal intensity. And I think this, so this is not an arthrogram. This is just a regular MR. So this joint is not distended. And this could help uh, if we had arthrogram, if we had contrast in there to delineate, but let's just call this the MGHL, this the anterior superior superior labrum. And as we go inferiorly, we see now that fluid signal intensity is gone and we have a normal anterior inferior labrum. So all of these variants end at the level of the equator. Here's just a book from the rad source or image from rad source where we can see the anterior superior labrum, superior, uh, nice, well-marginated fluid signal or contrast signal intensity and our MGHL. And that would should go away uh, at the level of, you know, three o'clock or less. And so we can see if we were look at the clock face, this is 12, this is three, this is nine, this is six. All of these variants really should go from like 11 or 10. They shouldn't go more posterior than the long and biceps origin, but there's some conflicting literature about that. If you wanna be real specific, I would give the patient to like 10 maybe, 11, and then they shouldn't go below three o'clock. Anything below that is pathologic. And so here's a sublabel sulcus, or recess where we see smoothly marginated contrast signal at the base of the labrum. And we can see that nicely on this axial plane with some fluid or contrast signal intensity there. But if we were to continue to scroll, that would just go away the, uh, you know, at the anterior superior aspect or posterior superior aspect of the labrum. So again, not pathologic. So a lot of these rules we're gonna see here shortly are kind of separating these variants versus disease. And here is, um, so now let's take a look at some pathology. Now we know that what's normal, and we know that one of the more common causes of glenohumeral instability and labral tearing is glenohumeral dislocation. So we can see nicely here, we have our hill sac impaction deformity of the superior, posterior superior humeral head. And that is because when we dislocate anteriorly, there's a little bit of medial positioning too around here, and the posterior superior humeral head impacts on the anterior glenoid, and that can cause a soft tissue bank heart or labral tear, or, or it can cause an osseous bank heart where we have a bank heart fracture. And just for extra credit, we can see here normal articular cartilage and some articular cartilage disruption here. So this is a torn anterior labrum, um, with the elevated periosteum and some articular cartilage disruption, so relatively complex injury. Here I wanted to show you, so the sagittal plane is specifically T1, and we talked about looking for muscle bulk at the cuff, but it's also a good plane, even the fat saturation is good, to look for these anterior bank hearts. And we can see nicely that we have a bony discontinuity between its host um, the underlying glenoid and this anterior fracture fragment. We can see that here on this axial fat saturated sequence, there's some marrow edema there and some cortical step off there and even some articular surface irregularity. So this is a nice example of a bony bank card and it doesn't look so much like a pear. And depending on how big this fragment is or how much of the bone stack is lost, maybe indicator for a ladder J um, procedure or some sort of anterior glenoid um, kind of reconstruction where they kind of take off the coracoid process and tack it back onto that anterior glenoid to increase the bone stock there. But this is what we're looking at here. My dog has just walked into the room. So when we're talking about the labrum anatomically, we separate into hextans based on this image you can see here on the right. We have our superior, anterior superior, anterior inferior, inferior, posterior superior, and posterior inferior. So when I am throwing these words out, this is how I'm localizing those abnormalities anatomically. And then, so how do we talk about what are the criterion for a tear? So signal intensity within the labrum as opposed to undermining it is more likely to be pathologic. 
Um, and we'll talk about that. Irregular margins rather than smooth is more likely to be pathologic. Signal intensity, as I've alluded to, posterior to the long head bicep tendon origin is more likely to be pathologic. If you want to be more specific, if everything else looks pretty decent, maybe give them just, you know, till 11, 10 o'clock potentially. I'd be interested to hear Dr. Um, Gorbachev's thoughts on that later. High signal intensity below the three o'clock position is more likely to be pathologic. Width of the space between the labrum and the underlying glenoid greater than two or 2.5, depending on arthrogram or non-arthrogram, and then paralabral cysts, as we said, as we will see, can suggest pathology. So look at this case, we can see contrast signal imbibing or getting into the substance of the labrum, and it's not following the contour of the glenoid, it's actually in the labrum, and that is pathologic. And we can see here this anterior inferior labrum is actually macerated and kind of scarred down here. So they're really, really bad kind of labral tearing here. Similarly, our, we see a paralabral cyst. We saw the cystic lesion in the musculature earlier, but this is in the spinal glenoid notch. And we can see is if we really squint that there's a linear fluid signal intensity in the anterior superior labrum or posterior superior labrum here with this resulting paralabral cyst. And similar to the knee and paramenisful cysts, this is a secondary sign of a labral tear. And there it is. And then so here's another question. That cyst that you saw there would result result or could result in impingement of the suprascapular nerve denervation of what? Yeah, maybe, maybe, who knows? We'll see here pretty soon. Ooh, that's what I like to see. Stump the crowd, got them all nervous. Okay, so I'm going to move on here. So yeah, in the spinal glenoid notch, so we have two areas. Suprascapular notch is a little bit more proximal. It's the same nerve, suprascapular nerve. If you clip it in the suprascapular notch, you can get supraspinatus and infraspinatus denervation. If you clip it where we saw it on this last case in the spinal glenoid notch, that's distal to the supraspinatus innervation. So really you only get infraspinatus. And we can see this like uh, relatively infiltrated muscular edema that is not feathery. And there's some early atrophy if you compare to the supra and subscap and teres minor here. So this is probably some subacute denervation due to a paralabral cyst that's not in this particular image. A um, couple last things, we can see our hill sacs and paction deformity. Here and here we can see this labrum is balled up and is kind of medially scarred down, all right? So there's a name for this, alphabet soup of musculoskeletal imaging. We have slaps, we have uh, alpsas, we have pulpsas. There's so many things like that. And this is an anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. This anterior labrum is medially, um, the periosteum is elevated and the labrum is avulsed from the periosteum and medially bunched up and scarred down. In this case, that's an alpsa. In contrast, this is called Perthes lesion, where the labrum is torn. Uh, there's the periosteal elevation. The labrum is torn from the glenoid, and but it's not medially retracted. So this is a Perthes lesion. And if you look at them side by side here, we can see the difference. Medially um, bunched up versus just elevated, attest, persistently attached to the periosteum without um, a, you know, periosteal separation from the labrum. And the articular cartilage looks pretty good. So that's all I have for you. Appreciate uh, everybody paying attention to me chit-chatting over the next last 45 minutes. And if there's any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you so much, Navid. This was terrific, very engaging. And um, so uh, while people are typing any last minute burning questions, I just wanna summarize that we learned in the last 45 minutes that number one, Dr. Faraji's trainees are a lucky bunch. <laughs> and, um, this is very engaging uh, teaching and things for the residents to Google after we're done. I'm sure the Google search is gonna skyrocket is the multi structure of the subscapularis, acetabulization of the um, acromion, um, aponeurotic expansion of the supraspinatus that's got us all uh, really like humbled at the beginning I saw that pause um, and the last one is the monkey flute so this is the one who was uh, Google <laughs> speaking um, this is a wonderful talk very engaging um, my um, uh, the comment um, you I heard my name and then yeah, uh, yeah. my individual Paul so I, I think before we assume any conventions I would encourage talking to your referral base and if you operate on the assumption that this is a universal convention of or for anything really 
it's, it's good to always check and uh, whether your surgeons uh, follow the clock, no matter what, or whether they actually reverse the clock and three is always anterior or they just transfer the clock and for the opposite shoulder, it's going to be posterior. So before mm -hmm. we go in and report, and just I think it's helpful, or I would put in the beginning of the impression that assuming anterior position is three o'clock and, and so and so. But I, I found that over the years, just sticking to the, the, um, the hexagon and um, the, the, the areas, it's, it's like there is less ambiguity. So that, that was fantastic. Um, I had a question um, in terms of um, you showing some arthrographic, non-arthrographic imaging. What's your protocol for shoulder arthrogram? And I know we don't have much time left, but what's your recipe? Do you mix with iodine? Do you do fat suppress, not fat suppress? How you do it? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, when we do arthrograms, when I'm injecting the patient, so my cocktail is I do the Omni or the iodinated contrast separate from the um, gadolinium contrast. So, and we use short tubing, so we don't use long tubing, and that allows us to not have to change the, uh, change the, all we have to do is change the syringe. We don't have to change the tubing because it's so short. So, you know, first things first, I, you know, find the area of the humeral head medially, like middle third or superior to middle third. Um, I, and, you know, put the needle in the appropriate location, hit bone. And then through there, I put, you know, some iodine to contrast to make sure it contours to the glenohumeral joint. Sometimes it'll go medially under the coracoid process in the superior subscap recess, which I always tell residents to, that's okay. Make sure you know that the superior subscap recess communicates with the joint. Um, and then as long as that's good, then I add a little bit, uh, and then, then I change the syringe and I add my 0.1 GAD to 20 cc's of saline cocktail. And I only usually put in 10 to 12, depending on the size of the patient. Um, and then I just take everything out. And then as far as the protocol goes, um, we do one fluid sensitive coronal T2 fat sat, and then everything else is sat, uh, we do a sagittal T1 for any potential for, you know, muscle atrophy, but otherwise it's axial coronal sagittal T1 fat sat. And, you know, kind of a pearl here that is there anybody watching is that Or if you have any question whether you're in or not, it was a tough arthrogram, you're not sure, um, you can always, you can sometimes salvage that arthrogram by converting to a fluid sensitive conventional sequence if you find that you were not, in fact, in the joint. And sometimes you'll still see that label tear, you'll still answer the question. But if you don't convert it and you weren't in, you basically just, you know, wasted the patient's time, your time. And so sometimes you can save yourself on tough days when it's your first day as an attending or a fellow and you have no supervision, not telling a true story or anything, but um, you know, pay <laughs> close attention to that. And sometimes you can save yourself and the patient some trouble. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of deflect from philosophical discussion, um, but maybe we'll come back to it whether 3T non-arthrogram is better than 1.5, but the question that came before, before we would have to close is, thank you for excellent talk from um, uh, Juliana here. Thank you for the excellent talk. Could you please clarify regarding surgical candidate for rotator cuff tears, bursal sided tears more than three millimeter means thickness or is it AP dimension? Um, that was a great slide. Can you uh, go back and uh, talk, uh, explain the um, It is, yeah. It's that's that's the it's the thickness of the tendon. That's at least what I got from ortho bullets. Just mm -hmm. throwing it out there. So it's tendon thickness in that case, um, greater than three millimeters. And it's my understanding. I think the you know I don't want to give out any gray or black pearls, but it's three, three millimeters in the tendon thickness and the bursal side. And that's uh, what I got from the literature. I think I have a reference in my PowerPoint. What about, uh, what about AP dimension? Uh, is there, there a you, uh, for, let's say- There for, wasn't anything. Uh, um, right. Uh, so one of the numbers that is comes to is the for the full thickness tears, 14 millimeters. But again, mm -hmm. it also depends on the preference of the surgeon and patient athletic. Um, potential and um, the functional demands. So there is a lot of communication that needs to be made. So we do have quick answer. So arthrogram or non-arthrogram for you. Um, yeah, that's, 
Thank you, uh, Peter Young, for that question. I think there's studies that show that it's <laughs> that th there are some studies that show at least I think for the shoulder um, that it's the 3D 3T without versus 1.5T is non-inferior at least. Um, but I guess it just depends on your referral base. I know I think we get a lot of 3T non-arthrogram patients, um, but some some of our provi providers prefer. Um, oh, my preference. Mm, good question. Depends if I'm the person injecting or not. and depends how busy the list is that day. But um, <laughs> let's stay tuned for the white paper that yeah. right now for that was, a, you know, it's a wonderful working group and uh, commissioned by the society. So hopefully they'll give us the experience and the summary. Um, I hate to have to wrap this up. Okay. Uh, it was a wonderful talk and uh, um Please uh, email all your questions and difficult cases to Dr. Faraji <laughs> from now on. Um, please um, uh, remember that um, you know this is an interview season, and for our residents participant, thank you very much for joining us. I think this was uh, highly educational and, and highly enjoyable for me. And um, if you guys are looking for a good conversation starters for your fellowship interview, nothing works uh, as a best better icebreaker than to mention that recently I attended SSR residence education webinar. Um, so on that note, our next um, speaker is going to be um, wonderful Alexandra Sachs from Thomas Jefferson talking about osteomyelitis, septic joint, and other musculoskeletal infection. This is going to be on October 12th. And then shortly after, there will be a MSK fellowship panel um, uh, by Resident Fellowship Education Committee. So please tell all your friends, join us, and uh, we have people join us from Australia today. Whoa, thank you so much. And again, Dr. Faraji, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you for your time and agreeing to speak to us. Thank you so much. And then just a quick thing I was supposed to mention that there's a link in the chat for folks to provide feedback as we are always looking to improve um, yeah, pr improve upon what we are providing. So thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Gorbachev for being so kind.